to sleep, a chance to dream. We all live in a kind of continuous dream. When we wake, it is because something, some event, some pinprick even, disturbs the edges of what we've taken as reality. Most of us dream, perhaps not every night, but regularly enough that we're aware of their presence behind our closed eyes. Sometimes these dreams are singular events, but occasionally a dream repeats. Dreams are fascinating on their own, but recurring dreams have an even more alluring air about them, merely by the fact of their repetition. Why am I dreaming about this? What does this mean? Dreams can be peaceful, they can be haunting, and often they can be any combination in between. But while these dreams can feel worryingly real in the moment, once we've woken, the impossibility of the dream becomes all too clear. We know then that we were dreaming, and now we're back in the real world. But in Signalis, the 2022 survival horror game from indie developers Rose Engine, dreams and reality are intertwined, caught in an endless dance of unknowability. By their own words, Signalis is a game of searching for lost dreams. I say to myself that you were dreaming, but the explanation does not satisfy me, nor would it you. The first thing Signalis asks of you is to wake up. We're introduced then to Elster, an artificial human assigned to work aboard the exploratory vessel Penrose 512. The prompt to wake is twofold, most obviously because in the literal world of Signalis' science fiction setting, you've been in stasis and the ship is literally telling you to wake up. But secondarily, Signalis is planting in your mind the thought of sleep, and by association, the thought of dreams. Wake up. Stop dreaming. And so you do. We learn that this vessel, the Penrose 512, is an exploratory ship and only has two crew members. Elster, the replica, and Ariane, a human pilot. I saw the faint imprint here mere minutes into the game of Anne McCaffrey's The Ship Who Sang, the tale of a sentient ship and her human counterpart, though the deeper connections between these two stories would not be made manifest for some time. In Elster's world, your ship has crashed, your pilot is missing, and you need to find her. The surface onto which your ship has plummeted is harsh and desolate, Cold winds wash over your derelict vessel, obscuring whatever might lie beyond the edges of your vision. Elster wanders then through the snowbound landscape until arriving at a monolithic stony frame jutting up from a mound of ice, and beyond it, a staircase leading down into the earth. Within this pit, you discover a room, a book, and a radio transmitter. The book is The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers, and the radio transmitter, upon closer examination, appears to be repeating out a series of numbers. The numbers, read out in German by an ethereal, almost alien-sounding voice, are complemented by a piano rendition of Rachmaninoff's Isle of the Dead, Opus 29. The King in Yellow will make further appearances within the world of Signalis, as will the radio and the Isle of the Dead. Further details to be revealed and reborn in new ways as we continue to dream. But back in that room at the bottom of the pit, as these numbers and melodies continue to seep out from the screen and into our ears, we see flashes of Elster. Whether reality or dream is uncertain, as flashed amongst the images of Elster are other signs and symbols. First a radio tower, then a simulacrum of Arnold Bachlin's Isle of the Dead, the painterly inspiration for Rachmaninoff's musical accompaniment. The Isle, floating silently within a still, featureless sea, feels unsettlingly unreal. It is surely a place of dreams. A place unable to be traversed in reality, and so must be explored 
while one sleeps. Isle of the Dead was commissioned of Bachland in 1880 by Maria Berna, who'd seen an unfinished version of the work in Bachland's Florence studio, and wished to have it completed in memory of her dead husband. Bachland would do just that, and would later tell Berna that with the completed work she would be able to dream herself into the world of dark shadows. Finally, flashed in amongst this string of images are excerpts from H.P. Lovecraft's The Festival, where Lovecraft, supposedly citing an ancient manuscript, says, Great holes secretly are digged where earth's pores ought to suffice, and things have learnt to walk that ought to crawl. What isn't revealed by Signalis is that, within the broader text of the festival, Lovecraft prefaces the events of his story by describing his travels to a very ancient town I had never seen, but often dreamed of. As the music and imagers crescendo, once again we are asked to wake up. From this moment onward, Signalis only continues downward, hurtling into the crust of this icy rock with reckless abandon, wending ever deeper into the darkness, and ever deeper into a world increasingly detached from the familiar, detached from recognizability, deeper into dreams. Perhaps then it is no mistake that the act of transitioning from waking to sleeping is known as falling. We fall asleep, and we rise from bed. By the Oxford definition, to fall is to move downward, typically rapidly and freely, without control. So too are the movements between worlds in Signalis, first at that initial pit in the ice, and then into other, increasingly more unsettling chasms. It seems at times as though everything in Signalis exists only to become more alien, more foreign, more unknowable as Elster continues to search for Ariane, her pilot and partner. Even in that first room, in the depths of that first pit, an oddly unassuming space within this snowbound hellscape, there is a hint of unknowability. The numbers, transmitting from the radio, read out by the ethereal German voice, are real, or were real, recorded from a kind of shortwave radio station known colloquially as a numbers station. But the thing about most numbers stations is that they are designed to be unknowable. Anyone can pick up the frequencies, but the whole point of them is that the numbers are never addressed to anyone, nor are their sources ever revealed. Often the voices themselves are artificial, unreal, unidentifiable, synthesized approximations of human speech to mask their hidden truths. Assumptions have been made of the number station's intents, sure, that perhaps these numbers are coded messages to spies of various sovereign nations, and only the spies will ever know the true meaning of the messages. But perhaps that isn't the truth. Perhaps the numbers are just numbers. Perhaps they're just nonsense. We can recognize the numbers, understand their meaning in isolation, but strung together like this, we'll never understand their true purpose, and the voice on the other side of the radio might as well be speaking a wholly alien language. It could very well be the nonsense of a dream. In this moment, I recalled a similar use of a number station recording within the melancholic A Song for Europa from the late Icelandic composer Johan Johansson, the second track on his album Orphe, a sonic rendition of the Greek tragedy of Orpheus. Orpheus is a recurring character in many Greek myths, but his most famous tale, the one explored by Johansson in this album, is that of the death of Orpheus' wife, Eurydice. Wrought with sorrow over Eurydice's death, Orpheus descends into the underworld to bargain for Eurydice's life, a tale that could mirror Elster's own. For Orpheus and for Elster, descent is the only viable means of progress. And so we fall further into the quiet industrial corridors of Signalis' early moments. We wander the empty rooms, we read long discarded papers, we find remnants of a once inhabited world. And what few uncorrupted inhabitants we do come upon, they all say the same thing. You don't belong here. Turn back. Until finally, 
we come upon a replica named Adler who tells us, you shouldn't have returned. In all this, there was a menace and a portent, a hint of evil, an imitation of doom. Bird, beast, or insect, there was none. The wind sighed in the bare branches of the dead trees, and the gray grass bent to whisper its dread secret to the earth. But no other sound nor motion broke the awful repose of that dismal place. Elster continues to descend further into the dream. At times the world around her seems almost normal, but then, always unexpectedly, the world changes, impeding her progress or the decaying husks of other replicas. And we recall Lovecraft's words, things have learned to walk that ought to crawl. And in these moments the world becomes more fragmented, more at battle with itself. There is an inherent disjointedness to dreams. Often in the recounting of them it is made clear how brazenly incoherent the details of the dream were. Your dream might begin in your childhood home, but then when passing through the door to your bedroom it might open onto a beach. Perhaps that beach is Eugen Bracht's shore of oblivion. You look to the high cliffs standing statuesque over the snowy shore. Perhaps sunlight kisses their peaks, though perhaps they're on fire. And that there, buried in the sand, are those rocks, or are they skulls? The inclusion of Shore of Oblivion is interesting here for a few reasons. Firstly, one might imagine Brock's work existing just outside the frame of Bachlan's Isle of the Dead, as though were one to launch a boat from the shore of Brock's sun-kissed cliffs, they might shortly arrive at Bachlan's Isle. Secondly, these pieces are somewhat inextricably bound by history. Amongst the more famous owners of Bachlan and Brock's works was Wilhelm II, the last emperor of Germany before the abolition of their monarchy. Wilhelm owned both of these pieces, and perhaps seeing their subtextual connection as we have here, hung them next to one another. In such an arrangement, these two paintings then become as fractured segments of a singular, melancholic dream, both too pure, too barren, too conspicuously empty to be truly real. So too are these works displayed within one of the personal residences of Falk, another replica that haunts this dream you continue to explore. More curious explorers might discover here, tucked away in a dark recess of rock, another copy of The King in Yellow. Its repeated presence in the world of Elster's dreams demands we explore it further. The King in Yellow is a collection of short stories by Robert W. Chambers, some of which detail brief encounters by its characters with a diegetic text also titled The King in Yellow, a text seemingly untethered from reality, a text with power over the reader. One story follows a young man who, thinking himself part of the royal lineage of the titular king, plots the murder of his family and their loved ones to secure the throne for himself. An editor's note at the end of this story remarks that this would-be heir died in an asylum for the criminally insane. Another follows a painter and his muse who, upon finding a copy of the king in yellow in the painter's library, are both driven to madness and death killing or being killed by the desiccated corpse of the local church caretaker. This account is written in first person by the painter and ends mid-sentence, his life taken before his final thoughts can be memorialized. And in the stories that don't specifically mention this doomsaying tome, the specter of it looms just out of view. Throughout The King in Yellow, the woebegotten readers of its eponymous text, and even those who never explicitly encounter it, dream. They dream of the realm of the king. They dream of each other. They dream signs and portents of future tragedies. But most importantly, these dreams recur, and these dreams affect the world around them. They are haunted by worlds beyond their control. So too does Elster lack control over this haunted place. From this shore we look out across the sea, but we cannot see the isle.
The tower was breathing. The tower breathed. And the walls, when I went to touch them, carried the echo of a heartbeat. And they were not made of stone, but of living tissue. I don't know if I can convey the enormity of that moment in words. The tower was a living creature of some sort. We were descending into an organism. The dream morphs, drawing Elster into pockets of other, newer unrealities, texturally similar to the rest of the dream, but substantively different. Where once was a metal grate in the floor, now is a pulsing pit of exposed flesh, another depth into which we might descend. But surely this must be a dream. Descent into the earth, into deeper explorations of ourselves, is key to the events of Jeff Vandermeer's 2014 novel, Annihilation. The story follows a small group of explorers into the enigmatic Area X, a hostile, alien pocket of our own world whose existence defies study and explanation. Numerous groups of explorers have entered Area X in vain attempts to discover just what Area X is and why it came to be, but none have ever returned. Annihilation focuses on the Twelfth Expedition, and early in the story they come across a particular pit leading into the Earth. This pit appears at first as little more than a spiral staircase leading deep into the ground, down into some enigmatic stony structure, not recorded on any maps. Most of the explorers call this discovery a tunnel, but the biologist, through whose perspective we follow the events of the book, calls it a tower, though she is not immediately sure why such a distinction came to her. Perhaps it's significant then that Elster should later come into possession of the tower, a, in tarot, a signifier of unforeseen catastrophe, or in the reverse, an absence. Both would be reasonable readings of Elster's plight and her search for Ariane. In Annihilation, this exploration of the tower could be read similarly, but its depths become an obsession for the biologist, driving her further into the unexplored darkness against the wishes of her companions. Elster's explorations of Signalis Stygian depths are equally obsessive as she fights tooth and nail to find her missing pilot, even as others tell her to stop, to turn back, to go no further. These warnings manifest themselves with present specificity as we read a fragmented warning drafted by the Sandia National Laboratories in 1993 to deter would-be explorers from disturbing nuclear waste sites. The warning, in a slightly abridged form, reads as follows. This place is not a place of honor. No highly esteemed deed is commemorated here. Nothing valued is here. What is here was dangerous and repulsive to us. This message is a warning about danger. The danger is still present in your time as it was in ours. The danger is to the body and it can kill. The form of the danger is an emanation of energy. The danger is unleashed only if you substantially disturb this place physically. This place is best shunned and left uninhabited. Left out of these fragments is one particularly relevant passage in which the warning makes clear that the danger is below us. Elster does not heed these warnings. She descends, she makes her way below us and obsession becomes compulsion. I could no more have turned back than have gone back in time. My free will was compromised, if only by the severe temptation of the unknown. To have quit this place, to have returned to the surface without rounding that corner, my imagination would have tormented me forever. In that moment, I had convinced myself I would rather die knowing something, anything, I passed the threshold. We see then, beyond the threshold, more flashes of Bachlan's Isle. We see myriad other Elsters. We see the Isle juxtaposed with Brock's shore. And we see again, buried now not in snowy mounds, but in a sea of crimson, endless and still, the crashed Penrose. A shape flashes in our mind, etched into a lock on a door we walked through mere minutes ago, an infinite triangle the Penrose Triangle, 
an impossible object only able to be truly depicted from one specific perspective. Seen from any other angle, the triangle ceases to be. But the Penrose Triangle, from the right perspective, appears infinite. A continuous loop of geometry, impossible to discern where it ends and where it begins. Recurring, if you will. The Penrose Triangle is sketched, too, within a fragmented journal, its author unattributed, only describing their experience of being trapped within a dream of someone else. An eternal dream, through which they posit the only escape is death. Deeper into this dream, Elster encounters and collects six tarot cards, one of which, as we've said, is the tower, but one also is death. Eagle Eyes will note that in the design of this card, nestled within a rose, looming over a skeletal replica, is a Penrose Triangle. The triangle seems to mock death, or death mocks the triangle. If traditional interpretations are to be believed, perhaps this juxtaposition of images signals an end, perhaps, or a change in defiance to the infinity of our dreaming. We can hope. It is impossible to truly know how recurrent this world is. Are these other versions of Elster us? How many times have we dreamed this same dream? In this dream, time folds back in upon itself, affecting and re-affecting everything within it. You, Elster, recall how you met another replica unit, an Adler unit. This, to your mind, is the first moment you've met. And yet, later, reading a note left behind by another replica, a Calibri unit, you see that the Calibri had, at some point previous, probed the mind of her station's Adler, and seen within it memories of an Elster unit, one who'd never been aboard the station before. And the others here, the other replicas, are they dreaming this same dream too? Whose dream is it? Why are gathered replicas crying before Bachlan's Isle of the Dead? Stanislaw Lem's 1961 novel Solaris exists in a world such as this. In Solaris, a space station orbits around a mysterious planet, the eponymous Solaris, which, by some quirk of its planetary evolution, is home to a great sentient ocean, able to bring to life the dreams of people in close enough proximity to it, typically and hauntingly in the form of lost loved ones. For some, this becomes a dream from which they'd rather not wake. For others, it becomes a hell. For those for whom it is too hellish, the visitors are not permanent. They can be banished, either by homicide or suicide. Yet they will always return. The dream of them will recur, manifested time and again only in the solitude and silence of slumber. And these manifestations, these guests, when they do exist, do not exist in isolation. They become tangible and corporeal. They become a part of the shared world of the station. I realized that my situation was identical to that of the other inhabitants of the station. That everything I had experienced, discovered, or guessed at was part of a single whole. Terrifying and incomprehensible. That's how... Chris Kelvin, a psychologist sent to Solaris to determine the continued viability of scientific study there, describes the Solarian manifestations. In Andrei Tarkovsky's 1972 filmic adaptation of Lem's work, Kelvin quotes, ironically, perhaps, and at the insistence of one of the other scientists aboard the station, from Don Quixote. There is only one bad thing about sound sleep. They say it closely resembles death. Tarkovsky's film, as is the recurring theme of these stories, ends with a descent. A descent into the sentient sea. A descent into an infinite dream. In Signalis, Elster's descent continues. Hauntingly, we read from another diary, the author again unattributed, ten pages, each dated on the same day, each different and yet repetitious. The writer recalls events that have never happened and marks these entries as a story misremembered, slowly morphing with each retelling, like genetic material mutating and evolving. Finally, the author states, the answer lies below. Once again, we are told to wake up. Twice again, we are told to wake up. And the dream collapses.
By this point, I'd played Signalis for about seven hours, and having now seen the credits roll, I felt satisfied with the amount of game I'd played over the amount of time that I'd played it. But I knew from the trailer that there was a good bit of stuff I'd missed on that first playthrough, though, you know, maybe it was just that the devs had put some cool sizzle shots in the trailer that weren't actually in the game. But my brain assumed it was the former. And so I set Signalis aside, content to let my mind digest it a little more before taking another bite. And so Saturday night passed into Sunday morning. I slept, but if I dreamed, I do not recall the substance of it. Now, as fate would have it, I was alone for most of Sunday. I woke, and after a few discontented go-arounds through the world of Loop Hero, I decided to reboot Signalis and begin a second playthrough. I was met once again by Elster's eye, and the opening cutscene once again played out. I emerged from my little stasis chamber, and like a ton of bricks, I was immediately hit by something. The game was different. And then a memory fluttered into my mind. Early in my first playthrough, I'd become stuck. I had an item I knew I needed to use to unlock something, but I couldn't find the something I needed to unlock. So I turned to an internet guide, Gamer Brave's Signalis first playthrough walkthrough, parenthetical, minimal spoilers. In an effort to save myself from even the most minor of spoilers, I just frantically scrolled through the guide, skimming the text until I found what I was looking for. The odd title of the guide didn't click with me then, but later, as I stepped into into the first minutes of my second playthrough, it hit me. The guide had made special consideration to denote it was a guide for people's first playthrough, meaning, or implying, that following playthroughs must be different. It would become clear later that this semantic distinction was purely of my own making and not the intent of the guide authors, but in that moment, it set my mind ablaze. In my first playthrough, I woke up aboard a crashed spaceship, but in my second playthrough, the ship was still in space. Immediately, this little revelation turned Signalis into something wholly different, something I appreciated even more than before. This was a moment that instantly compounded the dreamlike quality of the game. As before, we are told to wake up. By this point, a not-so-subtle nod to the motif of dreams woven throughout Signalis. You wake up the first time aboard a crashed vessel. You dream the dream of your first playthrough. You take in the details, you forget others, but you remember the texture of it all. And then you wake up again. It's texturally the same dream, but the details are a little different. Were you in space before, or were you already on the ground? So I explored the ship. And then, the real twist came. Tucked away in her personal quarters aboard the Penrose was Arianne. The woman I'd been looking for. The woman I'd spent seven hours diving into hell to find. And just, here she is. Putting on music so we can dance. We dance together to Swan Lake. And then here comes another cutscene, and then here comes the revelation that this is not a second playthrough. No, no, no. This, this is still the first playthrough. We're back outside the ship. We're back in the snow. The wounds from our last explorations beneath the earth have persisted. We're back on the ship. We patch ourselves up. We stumble through the vessel, and we find a pit. Elster acknowledges with grim determination, I can't stop now. We recall the words of Vandermeer's biologist as she descends to the bottom of the tower. I could no more have turned back than have gone back in time. We descend, and the dream changes. We're back again on Brock's shore. Light still dances upon the tops of the cliffs, but the beach is different. The details have changed. A boat waits for us. A huge title card slams into the screen, indicating we've entered the third chapter of the narrative. And then, in case you, the player, haven't yet figured it out, the game drops you into another environment you've already been in, guiding you toward a room you've previously explored, where written on the chalkboard in big bold letters are the words, You've been here before. Even so, this place too is different. More corrupt. More grotesque. This was bonkers. 
Sure, Signalis is not the first time I've experienced such a narrative device, but it was easily the most subtle this technique has ever been explored. Remedy's Control did something similar, but shows its hand when, the first time it rolls to credits, they begin to distort, acknowledging that the game isn't actually over. But Signalis didn't do that. It rolled credits. It dropped me back into the main menu, and had I not had a little bit of extra time on my hands that weekend, it would never have seen me again. In truth, I, I probably would have gone back to it eventually, but certainly not with the immediacy I did here. And the trick here really is devilishly clever. The clues are all there. Hints that the dream has yet to conclude. All laid out with fiendish subtlety, deliberately coaxing you to return to the game. When I rolled credits that first time, I got an achievement, Das End, or The End in English. And this achievement had an interesting bit of flavor text. All it said was, fail. Fail, with a period. It immediately struck me as suspect, but I was unsure why. Perhaps it was its brevity. Just one word and one piece of punctuation. I was used to achievements that were defined by accomplishing specific things. Obvious memorials where the text would read, you know, collect A of B or explore X of Y. But thus end? Fail? Period? This was not an accomplishment. I thought then that perhaps this achievement implied that Signalis had multiple endings, and that I'd gotten the quote, bad ending, which, if true, provided at least some encouragement to go back and try again. And so, in the back of my mind, as I crawled into bed on that quiet Saturday evening, I thought to myself, maybe one day, maybe one day I'll be able to find that woman I was looking for and get the good ending. And then I fell asleep. And then I awoke, and the next morning, as stated unsatisfied with my late game progressing in Loop Hero, I returned to Signalis and was once again greeted by its Blade Runner-esque main menu. In truth, this is the perfect method of narrative continuation for the story Rose Engine is trying to tell. How many of us, roused from a deep sleep, suddenly find ourselves grasping to keep hold of the dream we just left? And at times, when returning to sleep may still be an option, how many of us have willed ourselves against all hope that as we fall back asleep, we might return to that same dream to see where it goes? But for all our willfulness, we are never able to return to the dream. In our waking, its continuity has been broken. We may yet dream, but it will not be the same. And so Signalis, in this perfect trick of its narrative design, engages in this very specific form of wish fulfillment, and drops us right back into the icy world of Elster and the Penrose, to pick up where we left off. Changed, yes, but persistent. The dream continues. Our rescue can advance. We can descend deeper. It was here then, towards the end of Elster's descent, that the faint impression of the ship who sang became more tangible. In the ship who sang, various interstellar vessels throughout the galaxy are not merely mechanical constructions, but are controlled by real human minds. These ships are known colloquially as brain ships, and are operated by a pair of crew members, one of which is the ship itself. The second crew member, known as a brawn to the brain that is the ship, is chosen at the discretion of the brain ship, and subsequently the partnerships between ship and caretaker are often deep and profound, with Helva the ship about which all the events of the book transpire, remarking of her first partner, a man named Jenin, that she loved him. A love beyond mere respect or admiration, but a physical kind of love such as she could never truly experience, yet passionately yearn for. We get this impression too at the beginning of Signalis' third act, when we finally see Elster and Arian together. They dance. They kiss. They fall asleep. We learn more of the Penrose mission. It has been ongoing for more than 3,000 cycles, which, according to their mission documentation, is the point at which, if they have not yet found a new and habitable world, they might as well call it quits. So far out into the cosmos, they lack the fuel to return. 
and with spare parts in short supply, the ship will begin to degrade. The reactor housing will deteriorate, spilling radiation into the ship. Mission documents claim that at this point, the ship's replica is 860% more likely to survive to continue the mission, and all efforts should be made to preserve the replica, rather than, quote, prolonging your own suffering. The mission guidance suggests letting the replica kill you, rather than enduring the pain of acute radiation poisoning. In the ship who sang, there is a similarly inevitable end to the partnerships of brains and bronze in the employ of the central worlds. The ships outlive their partners. They're built for it. Even a successful team will eventually part in this way. The mobile human partner dies of old age. The ship persists. It does not take long for tragedy to befall Helva and Jenin. A few years into their partnership, the central worlds discover the star Ravel has become unstable and the nearby planets need to be evacuated. Helva and Jenin depart for this system and begin evacuating the residents of a remote monastery. The evacuees are hesitant, not wishing to abandon their home, not fully believing in the very real danger of the incoming supernova. As such, Helva and Jenin are late in their departure from this planet's surface, racing all too close against the leading edge of the supernova. And in the tumult and panic of the evacuation, Jenin becomes trapped in the airlock as they flee to orbit, and dies by the heat of the expanding star. All this is witnessed by Helva monitoring the situation through her vast array of onboard monitoring equipment. The text then notes that only the iron conditioning of her training prevented Helva from swinging around and plunging back into the cleansing heat of the exploding sun. Helva has lost someone she loves, a feeling she never expected to feel, and this specter of loss hovers over every other story in the book. Though she is able to eventually find peace with her grief and continue on in service to the central worlds, she never forgets Jenin. Unlike Helva, Esther does not know with such certainty that Ariane is dead. She searches through the dream because she knows or at the very least hopes that Ariane is still alive. And we learn too that throughout the dream of Elster's explorations, Elster is not just searching for Ariane because her mission parameters demand it, but because she loves her. She descends and descends and descends, not because of some pre-programmed loyalty to the nebulous idea of the mission, but because she loves Ariane, heart and soul. We might then recall a much ballyhooed line of dialogue from Christopher Nolan's Interstellar where Anne Hathaway's Dr. Brand says, Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Signalis might add to that, time and space and dreams. This is uh, Jake Terrio with Subpixel. Um, Will says I can't come back to the studio unless you like and subscribe. And if you leave a comment, he even says he'll give me a warm uh, blanket. So uh, please do that, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next video.